it all started for me was um, I started working at Falconry Centre um, at, at Newant down in Gloucestershire, and um, I'd always wanted to do. Oh, I always wanted to do a historical field sport. Love my history. I always wanted to be actually doing something historical. So I was a gamekeeper for, for many years, and I sort of realised after a while that instead of the historical way of gamekeeping it become modern, we were releasing intensively weird birds and. You know, it wasn't quite the original historical field school. So then I went on to try deer stalking. But instead of walking around with a longbow up in Scotland, hunting deer, very, very modern again, contracting, um, use, you know, very strict firearms legislation and training. So I went through all that, but it wasn't really what I was passionate about. So um, finally I got the chance to do falconry. Um, which is what I always wanted to do since the, since the start, I never had the chance. And then I was really disappointed to learn that falconry was the same. It changed completely and it wasn't historical anymore. So how I was taught was um, what we'd, how we trained the birds was we'd take their food away. And we'd put the bird out in the, in the garden or, or out in the field and then we just wouldn't feed them. And every day you'd go out with a bit of food on your glove and you'd kneel down and whistle the bird and if it wouldn't come to you then you just wouldn't feed it and go out the next day um, and eventually the hunger overtakes the fear and the bird will come to you rather than die and then you weigh your bird on a set of scales and record what weight it was and then you know roughly that's how hungry the bird has to be so if I wanted to fly the bird I'd say well when it came to me it was hungry enough at one pound five so Every time I want to fly it, I need to make sure that I don't feed it until it weighs one pound five, and then it will fly. Now, there's several problems for this. One being this wasn't the historical methods. This is a modern scientific method of, of flying birds. Um, two, it didn't really, to me, feel like you were giving them the respect that I wanted to give. That you know, I felt they should have. But also, because they're controlled through hunger. If you make one mistake, feed them slightly too rich of food or a bit too much food, they won't come back to you. They'll get lost. They'll fly away because they don't want anything to do with you. They don't bond with you. They don't love you. They don't want to be with you. They only come to you because they're desperate for food. So one mistake, and the bird's not hungry, off it goes. And you've lost the bird. If it kills something and you don't get there before it's eaten it, once again you've got a lost bird. And you've got to sit out under a tree or out in the woods until it's hungry enough to come back to you. We like to spend with our family, our friends, and like So a modern falcon uses a scientific approach to train their birds, and it's very much about weighing the quantities that you get the bird to be clean as you start reducing the amount of food that you give the bird. So it seems a little bit strange to me, and of course historically um, they didn't have radio tracking. We can rely on radio tracking to find the bird now. But it seemed to me, why would they, they wouldn't have used these techniques historically because the bird's too unreliable. So I was about to give it up and then we bought a historical manuscript dated from the 11th century and it was written by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II and he was an avid falconer and he wrote a veritable bible on how to train and fly birds. So I bought this manuscript and there was one key phrase in it that said all birds need to be flown in a high condition, which means well fed. So this was exactly the opposite to what I've been taught. So I decided to start looking into the historical methods and how they actually trained them in history rather than modern methods. I found nobody did these methods, nobody understood them, we couldn't learn them from anyone. So basically over the last 10 years we've had to be collect manuscripts, historical manuscripts, we've got a collection of over 30 now, and we've trained all our birds using these historical manuscripts. So the difference is, is Instead of just taking the food away from your bird until it's so desperate for food it'll come to you, we're doing the opposite. We're feeding them as much food as they can possibly eat. And rich food as well. Good quality food that modern falconers really wouldn't dare fly their birds on. But how we get them reliable is by building up a bond of trust. So modern falconry but always, they all say, you cannot build up a bond of trust or love with your bird. They only come to you because they're desperate. Historically, you had to build up this bond of trust. So what we'd do is we'd keep them with us 24-7. Now with the falcons, they're quite um, 
quite easy to manage compared to the Hawks, so we keep them with us 24-7. Historically, you'd have a perch exactly the same as this up in your bed chambers, in the banqueting hall, and you'd even have them at church. So you had no excuse not to go to church because you could take your bird with you. And you keep them with you all the time, everywhere you went, you'd have your bird. And you've got to remember, these people were noble class. So they had servants and they had plenty of time. So they could keep these birds with them all the time. And after quite a, quite, quite a long period of time of keeping these birds with you, eventually the birds start showing signs that they're comfortable with you. They learn that they're protected when they're on your glove from external stimuli. They're well fed as much food as they can possibly eat. And more importantly, you don't harm them. And eventually they'll show key signs like sitting up with one foot in the air, they'll clean their beak on your glove, or they'll fall asleep on your glove, and then you know they're, they're, they're manned, they're trained, they trust you. They love you, they respect you, and then you can start the flight training. So it's a lot more labour intensive than what we do today. So a modern falcon can train a bird in approximately 10 days by taking its food away. Um, this girl here took me about a year of staying with me all the time, wherever I went, whatever I do. Now that's the falcons. Now we also had another guy, instead of the falcon, I called an ostringer. Now he flew our native hawks. So we've got a Cipita gentilis, the goshawk, and a Cipita ninesis, the sparrowhawk. And these are prolific killers, so these will bring in food for the table. The falcons are mainly used for political purposes. Now the, the, the goshawks are very, very skitty, very shy birds in the wild. They don't like human contact, and a lot of them will quite happily just die of stress. Very, very hard birds to manage. So to carry them around with you 24-7 like you would the falcons, it's quite difficult, so it becomes a lot more intensive when you start training the hawks. So we do a term that we call waking. Now how we train the goshawks is, is when we first get them, we get them on the glove. And we sit up for four days and nights without sleep. And we keep the bird awake for four days and nights without sleep. So every time the bird's eyes start getting glazed or they close their eyes, wiggle your glove. And this is why it's called waking continually waking up the falcon, the, the hawk. You wiggle your glove until they wake up again, and you keep doing this for four days. By the end of the fourth day, the bird is in a really, really tired and vulnerable state. And when this bird is this vulnerable in the wild, they're easy prey and they know this. So they quickly realise that once they're in that state, we haven't harmed them, we've fed them lots of food, and we've protected them. So it's a very, very quick four-day process, but you have to be able to stay up four days and nights without sleep with your bird. The problem I made is I ordered a pair of goshawks and they came at the same time. <laughs> so we had to sit up for four days and nights with the first one, have a night's sleep, and then go straight onto the second one, which was a little bit more intensive than... But um, these, are the, these are the methods that we used in practice historically. Now, I, I wondered for years and years and years, at why we threw away what I consider much more humane and much more reliable methods for the modern techniques that seem very unreliable um, and very disrespectful to the birds. And then it dawned on me, it's our modern culture, it's our modern day-to-day -day life. So historically, as I said, you were a noble class, you had all the time in the world, you had servants to do everything you needed, so you could spend all day with your bird. Nowadays, People want to be able to fly birds even if they haven't got the spare time. So if you work in 9 to 5, it's easier to starve, take your food away on a Thursday, starve the bird till Saturday and it'll fly for you, rather than spend all day every day for a year keeping the bird with you all the time, which is totally impractical for our modern culture. So these techniques have overcome now. Um, and what we're really about now is we're the only people in the UK that still research and practice these techniques. So we want to try and keep these techniques alive. Um, we're predominantly about research rather than show falconry. Now, for example, we had a, a, a medieval picture of two falconers in medieval co costume poking their birds with sticks. Now, in the first falconry book I got, there was a reference to this picture saying 
his, an, an evidence of historical falconry. Obviously the birds had done something wrong and they were being chastised by being poked and hit with sticks. Now this didn't seem right compared to our manuscripts. And it wasn't until I got my gossel that I found out what this technique was for. So because she was on my glove and I needed to get her used to me and calm, every time I tried to stroke her she'd attack my finger and peck it. And of course it hurt because she was a big bird. So I'd pull it away. She would then learn that I would leave her alone every time she pecked me, so she carried on the behaviour. I suddenly remembered this picture, about four o'clock in the morning. So I picked up a stick, stroked her with the stick, she pecked the stick a couple of times, realised it had no effect, and ever since then I've been able to stroke her and keep her calm. So this is what we're about, trying to look at these historical manuscripts, the pictures in them, and change the modern perspective of what these techniques were used for by putting them into practice. Now, for example, this um, book I, I spoke about, the first manuscript we purchased, written by Frederick II in the 11th century. So it, it, it's, it's quite a European-style technique he talks about, although he does fly some of the Arabic falcons. So I trained all my peregrines using these techniques, and I found that it worked a lot better. I found that when I worked at a modern falconry centre, because they were hungry, I could keep a peregrine in the air for four or five minutes. His flights would be like a pirate ship, up, straight flight to the food, up, straight flight, because it was starving. Since we use these techniques, she can stay in the air for an hour and a half at some of the venues we do, um, because she's not hungry, she's fit, she's healthy and she's enjoying herself. So I trained the, all my peregrines using these techniques, and my wife Helen then got Ferenc here, the sacred falcon from the Middle East. So she started using these techniques to train for rent, so we couldn't get anywhere with him. He wouldn't fly at all. Kept going and just sitting in a tree, doing one pass and that was it. We couldn't work out why. It wasn't until Helen found a Persian treatise from the Middle Ages and started training him using the Persian treatises from his own country, and now he's one of our best showbirds. So what we do now is each bird from each country, we collect historical manuscripts, um, from that country and train each bird using those manuscripts because after all they're more experienced with their native birds than we are. Uh, hence why we've used different, I use the European for my birds because I fly the European birds and Helen uses the Persian manuscripts for her birds because she flies the Persian birds. That's basically what we're about really, is um, mainly research. The big problem we do have is that our birds keep killing things in front of the audience. <laughs> <coughs> now historically you take your bird from the wild, you train it and fly it for a season and then release it back into the wild to breed. Whereas nowadays that's illegal. So what we have to do is either get our birds imported from abroad so that they're wild because we can't say we're doing historical falconry if we're using captive bred tame birds. They've got to be wild in the first place, just as they were historically for our techniques to work. So we either have to get them imported from abroad at great cost, or we get what's called wild disabled birds. Now if a peregrine's been injured in the wild and she can't be re-released because of injury and she can't hunt, you can get a license to breed. Because that bird was wild, she'll instill all those instincts on her first generation of chicks. So effectively her first generation of chicks will be as wild as the parent. So whereas most people will pay a thousand pounds for a peregrine, we pay four and a half for these wild instincts. But it means we can do this historical research and practice them and try out these techniques as they would have been done back in history. So we always have to say now, because these birds are wild and they know how to kill and hunt, that um, you know, if you're a bit squeamish, we're not the people to be what coming to see. We're about the research and trying to keep these traditions alive rather than actually just put on a show. Um, there's plenty of people that put on a medieval outfit with a, and carry a, a sort of Harris Hawk or an inaccurate bird. But um, all our birds are reared accurately, they're all accurate species and all our costumes and equipment are all accurate. We do have to make a couple of concessions because I had a peregrine many years back and um, I made perches, exact copies out of the manuscripts, and these perches had a, a, a cork or a stone top to them. 
So we put all our birds on these perches and my peregrine got what we call bumblefoot. And it's where they get, it's almost like bed sores. Where they get sores on the bottom of their feet from their perches. And I couldn't understand this. I, I, how can the medieval people have used them? Or, you know, historical people all throughout history. And all of a sudden my birds got sick from these perches. And then it dawned on me. Again, four o'clock in the morning when I usually do my thinking. And it's because, as I said, they take them from the wild, train them and fly them for a season, and then release them back again. So they're only on those perches for a few months a year. Whereas our birds, because we're you're not legally allowed to release them under the Wildlife and Protection Act, they've got to be on their perches all year round. So we quickly dawned on this, so we had to get rid of the accurate cork tops and go for the astroturf there so that their feet can breathe and it stops the pressure. And of course, we now use radio tracking because historically we have records and accounts from say James the first we got some of his accounts and he was spending million, equivalent of millions of pounds a year on rewards for lost birds and of course if you're a peasant that's like winning the lottery so everybody will be out looking for the king's bird and they will get returned very quickly fortunately nowadays um, as, as you can see on the board birds uh, the prey are quite persecuted nowadays so instead of looking for them to return, more people are looking to shoot them if they see them. So we do put the radio tracking on them nowadays so that we can find them quickly before any sort of landowners or, or gamekeepers decide that they want to take a, a shot at them. But as, uh, apart from that, we try to be as accurate as possible and just keep these traditions alive and put them into practice. So has anyone got any questions? I answered everything. What type of bird would a king have flown? Would that be an eagle, a bigger bird than a falcon? Um, well, we have a, um, a list from a book called The Boke of St. Albans. And it was written in the 1480s by a woman called Jane Juliana Burnus. And she was actually a nun. Now, she wrote this book because her son had become a squire to a knight. He'd gone off to train to be a knight by being a squire. So she wrote this book on everything he needs to learn to be a knight. And this covers falconry, heraldry, martial arts etiquette and in it there's this list and you've probably heard of a folk a kestrel for a knave <laughs> a film, a film and well this is where this comes from you had this list that she'd written in this book um, and we've got it here you know so we've got Lord Leicester there the Duke's bird and we have Isabella Peregrine the Earl's bird and this is where this list comes from and a lot of modern falconry books say that this was law so if a peasant was caught with a duke or king's bird, they would have their hand cut off or their eye put out. But there's no actual historical evidence of this at all. Nothing's been written about that at all. Really, it was a satirical list so that he could basically work out. When he was out in the hunting field, if he saw someone holding a peregrine, then he would be able to say, oh, that guy must be a duke, so therefore I need to give him the etiquette that I would give a duke. So it was really a guideline that she'd given him so that he could work out how to act to certain people by what bird they were carrying. Now, of course, a duke would only really be able to afford a peregrine falcon. If a peasant had a peregrine falcon, he wouldn't be executed for it. They'd probably say, where did you steal that from? Because that's worth a lot of money. But, you know, it was, it was just a guideline, really. So, the king on that list, it says, for an emperor, let me if I can remember off the top of my head, an emperor is an eagle or a vulture. Now, you've got to remember, um, historically, falconry was actually political. It wasn't really used for hunting. You hunted with the birds, but they didn't bring in enough food for the table. The Ostringer with the hawks, they would be going out and bringing 30 rabbits in with one bird, because the goshawk really does kill. So these guys would be used to make a political statement. So when the ambassadors came over from another country, you take them out hawking and you'll be showing them millions of pounds worth of birds. So you'll be making a statement saying, don't invade me, I can afford a strong, ar a large army, strong defences, if I can afford these birds. And this is the way they would prevent wars. So the emperor having the vulture and the eagle, because it would have cost so much money for this vulture to be imported from out from Africa or wherever they came from at the time, it would show that you were rich, you know, you were very, very powerful. Um, so really it was more of a, a show-off thing rather than for its hunting prowess. Um, so when hunting, the king, I mean we have the records and accounts of the kings,
Henry VIII was a very, um, even though he, because he was a king, he could have the vulture or the eagle. Because he was the king, uh, you know, because he was the king, he still loved the gospel. He would go out with the gospel, he would go out with the peregrine falcon, um, and he even like lanner falcons. Now, we haven't got our lanner with us today, but they're very quite small birds and not really worthy of much killing, but Henry VIII seemed to like them. Um, we're trying to find out at the moment by searching the, the manuscripts what he actually used them to hunt with, um, what, hunt, hunt with them.